engaging mobile users. Quite a fancy term. The question is, what does it entail? Before I continue, um, who am I? For those who haven't seen any of my other presentation yet, my name is Alex Blascher. I'm the tech lead for Mute Mobility Development. And um, yeah, most of that work happens in sunny Australia. You should visit it, give it, give it a try. Um, I recommend sunglasses though. So in, during this presentation, I'd like to concentrate on the location API, which is positioning, um, maps, navigation, geocoding. What that entails, I'll come to shortly. And uh, in the second part, I really like to talk about sensors. And I have a couple of demos for you as well, so that you can see the stuff in action. Positioning. That's the, out of all the things that I'm going to talk about, that's the only thing that is, has been part of Cube Mobility 1.0 already. And it's essentially the ability to to uh, inquire, where am I? You get either you get some set of longitudes, latitudes, GPS data, potentially some velocity data. Um, essentially, putting yourself, put a dot on the map. How that's done is really up to the platform. Essentially, we try to hide away all the different positioning methods on the platform. I mean, you could have potentially a GPS if the user has chosen to do so. You could use GPS, um, you could use potentially IP-based kind of positioning, you could use somebody in a previous um, presentation mentioned Wi-Fi-based localization. There are many ways of doing that, but essentially we don't want to burden the third-party developer with all that, well, difficult stuff. You get one location source back from the system, which ensures that um, it gives you the most appropriate uh, well, the co coordinate as they are right now. You may be able to say, okay, I prefer um, satellites over a GPS, or I'm actually just after a quick, quick localization, just use a GPS for instance. If the user has per permits, of course, that uh, as, a, as a kind of um, positioning method. After all, the system does have its own settings, in particular on, on, on MAMO and uh, Symbian platforms, where the user can actually turn off a GPS for instance, then obviously, the posi that positioning method falls away. But that allows you to sort of make also some calls with regards to power performance, um, et cetera. But essentially what you get is you start an update and you get continuous updates based on the time interval that you, that you are interested in. And, or you can actually request a single shot. And if you need another one afterwards, ask for it again. So update intervals and multiple position methods are it's a bit, kept encapsulated and hidden away. And yes, that's also the way how we then add new positioning methods if they would be coming along, if there would be some coming along. Your application would just make use of it as soon as it's enabled in the platform. And this, uh, the, the last part of the positioning API is the hardware adaption. So as I mentioned earlier, different platforms have different support. And um, the our, the, the Qt Location API essentially uh, allows you to, well, you don't have to worry basically about how to do that in Symbian or how to do that on a Amigo device, Memo device, as a matter of fact, on a Windows device. Um, out of the box, it's obviously on the Nokia platforms. It's, it's slightly more difficult to get that on desktop platforms. Um, conceivable possibilities there would be some remote GPS that some GPS USB stick or something like that. Essentially some device that's external and um, the support that we have in that area at this point is NMEA support. So if your device uh, spits out NMEA data, then you can just point it to the device and from there out on you will get your uh, positioning updates. Obviously that um, in, in that particular case, you do need to be you, need to, you do need to basically use that particular, a particular class which we provide, which is otherwise not hooked up. So here's a quick example. We are getting a 
geoposition info source. It's a static function call, a create default source. That function call will return something or not. That's pretty much the extent of the platform abstraction. If, the plat if there's nothing, like let's say on Linux, then you will get a null pointer back. Hence, it's very important that the first thing you do is test source. And essentially, then you just look, uh, hook yourself into the position update, and you get, uh, in return, you get position information. The position info there is basically coordinates, timestamps, etc. In this particular case, it's a 10-second update interval, and I uh, actually prefer non-satellite positioning methods. So in this particular case, the GPS ship would probably not be started unless it's already started by somebody else. Then the, cho the, the platform already makes the choice that, well, okay, my, the GPS ship is actually on, online already because this other application over there acquired it. I'll give you any, a GPS signal from the satellite anyway because I have it already. So this is kind of a preferred kind of thing. The platform makes intelligent decisions based on that. And last but not least, I start the update. Yes, there's also an API to, uh, that allows you to get satellite information. Very similar pattern. There's a create default satellite source, I believe it's called. And again, depending on what the platform supports, you get the pointer back and you can use that. That's as far mobility, as far as mobility 1.0 went. <coughs> What's the new stuff? Essentially, mapping, geocoding, and routing. What is that? Mapping is essentially the ability to present, draw a map in a widget, in a QML context, sort of what you know from Google Maps. Essentially the same, the same uh, tile-based uh, data that's being drawn. Geocoding, that's the ability to, I'm here, I have an address, please convert that into coordinates, or vice versa, I have these coordinates here, please kind of translate them into addresses. So that's resolution. And last but not least, routing. So I'm, I'm at point X, I want to go to Y, and you get a set, a list of coordinates where you, where you would possibly go. And there's the ability to also show that on the map in detail later on. Now, where does the data come from? Essentially, there are three types. Offline, the device has some database on the, um, on, on, on the device. I don't have to go anywhere online. That's the first option. The second option, it's online. Um, essentially, what we're using here is NavTag data. We're connecting to the NavTag server. Very similar API to what Google Maps uses as well. And that data comes back to the device. So it does require online capabilities. And the last case is the hybrid case, which is kind of, well, making intelligent decisions between, well, do I want to go online, get all that data, or do I make use my potentially outdated data on the device? Also, most devices have the ability to upload new map data via the usual manufacturer-specific interfaces. Now, then there are a couple of extension points. Well, there's one extension point. It's basically a plug-in mechanism. Each of the, it's conceivable that you can use multiple um, providers, multiple map data providers. Mobility 101 comes with a, a default online uh, plugin. That means it will talk to the NavTag server. And that works, there are some terms and conditions, but essentially that works, it's pos available for every platform every single platform that Qt supports. And the second part, and that's the part that's where Nokia devices have a slight advantage. They will also be able to use the on-device uh, maps data. So you, if you were to be an application developer for a Nokia platform, you will also be able to, I guess, choose between the two. In fact, the Nokia uh, specific solution actually is a hybrid solution. So it again makes some intelligent decisions based on the user's preferences, I guess. Now, what does the plugin look like? Essentially, the plugin is just a shell. It provides the three things 
that we want uh, the mapping manager, geo search manager, and the geo routing manager. And if you have a have some kind of contract with some other uh, map provider, you basically just write a plugin that provides exactly that kind of an implementation for those interfaces, and you're good to go. That will be rendered on the on the maps uh, as it comes out. <coughs> an interesting side effect here. Um, we do not combine, you, you can in theory do that, but you, we do not combine the data from multiple sources. So let's say I want to get, have two plugins, one's talking to NavTag, one's talking to Google Maps. Um, you can do that, but you have to basically ins get two instances of the service provider loading the two plugins, and then you have to do your own co data correlation. Why do we do that? Why don't we make that a bit easier? Presumably you could get some error rates, um, some error data, erroneous data could be basically synced or so. Well, essentially I've seen cases where um, the same object was on position coordinate here and in the next data provider it was somewhere there. So depending on how much the difference is between the data providers, uh, you might find that um, they're slightly out of sync with each other. Location, the maps and navigation part is one of the few parts where mobility actually provides you graphical classes, elements, etc. Um, it has a graphics geo map, which you basically can embed into a graphics view context. That's essentially done done here. Um, the geo mapping manager, are one of the three things coming out of the plugin, is the guy who's res responsible for that. Um, the geo map is uh, uh, added to the graphics scene. The graphic graphic scene is added to the graphics view, and there you go. Now you can do whatever your heart desires. Um, you can you can uh, put the map on into embed the map into any kind of widget that you have. So note there is no HTML embedding or website embedding required. So you can do that in your native application if you desire to do so. And yep. The question was whether this can be done on desktops. Yes, you can do that. Um, and then you can have a couple of options what you can do with your geographic geographics geo map. You can add adjust the zoom levels, so zooming in, zooming out. Typical use case is also street view, satellite view, terrain view. That's the map type here. And of course, you can set the co uh, set the uh, coordinate, set, tell the map, show me the coordinate x, y, z, and then the, the widget basically centers in on that. Note that the the map object always translate always works in real world coordinates. In other words. Um, you say, I want to see longitude, latitude, X, Y, Z. You tell it the, to, the, uh, to the map, and it will zoom to that. There is no, I guess, the viewport translation for actual positioning on the screen that is basically done for you. You just tell it where you want to go. And of course, you can pan, zoom around, etc. And then, of course, you can perceivably implement things like, if the user clicks on X, what should happen? Maybe add a marker or something, or... Um, zoom in, double click event. It's this, the standard Qt event system that you would need you know, sub subclass from, uh, from, from Q graphics geomap, and then you can do whatever you desire. So I've done that here. My geo geomap, in this particular case, I've decided to have a, to react to the mouse move event. Essentially, I um, um, want to pan around on the map. I'll take the previous position, Get the uh, get the new position in screen coordinates, get a difference, and then I pan to it. Another option here is most double click event. Um, so up on double clicking onto a particular location, um, I center the map to it and I zoom in at the same time by one level. So I have a demo here. <coughs> And this does require network capabilities. It seems to be very slow at the moment. Hopefully we get some data. Presumably your application might actually choose to zoom in on the current location of the, the user. Um, 
my laptop doesn't have a GPS signal, and not that I get a GPS signal in this room anyway. Um, I've chosen to show sunny Brisbane, Australia, in case nobody knows where it is. Where it is. Um, and it's essentially the same things apply here. I can uh, double click, zoom in, the data comes when it comes, um, and zooms further in. It's really what you also know from uh, Google Maps. Of course, let me just go a bit further in. Starting from a certain perspective, uh, so from a certain zoom level, you will also get um, satellite data. So the small application basically just um, trigger. I can basically choose what kind of data I'm after. And it's really slow. And hopefully, we'll see something. <coughs> so this kind of online, uh, online um, usage um, is all this data that you see here comes from the Navtex server or Nokia server, as a matter of fact. And you can, this is a standalone Qt application. I don't have any specific Nokia libraries anywhere. This is shipped with mobility as such. So you can also use this on a Mac if you want to. Um, and of course, Terra data. Um, due to the slow network, I'll probably skip on that. Now, now we have a map. We want to put something on the map. Um, presumably, some custom pix maps. Um, I might actually have a. Um, I might actually want to show a route or something. QGeoMap object is the class to go for that. Essentially, you tell it, I'd like to put a, uh, a marker on longitude, latitude, x, y, z. And it basically draws it on, on top of your graphics view. Then you can, of course, group them. So you could say, OK, I, I create an artificial grouping in, within the application that says, OK, show me all the pizza shops. All these markers are pizza shops. so I have a grouping for that. Um, at the moment, we're using the graphics view um, insertion order. So well, the way it's drawn is the first item goes on the screen. The next item goes on top of that if the Z order is the same. If you, of course, have a different Z order for your graphics uh, view item, then obviously one is being, going to be below or above the other. But essentially, at the, if you don't do any Z coordinate uh, handling, then one on top of the other. And the types we can at the moment show here, um, paint, are rectangles, circles, text, pix, map, polygons, polylines, and the route. And here's a user can then say, OK, show me all. Uh, you can basically select certain things. You can query about them. Everything that's currently in my viewport or anything that's within a certain radio, radius uh, or rectangle, as a matter of fact, so say, okay, this is my center and everything from there and 500 meters further in each direction, please select all those map objects. Here's an example. Well, it's really a selected example. There's a lot of code missing, but essentially what I'm trying to show you is that uh, the user has selected on, on has clicked on the screen and he basically gets one or more objects in that particular position. Um, if there was an object already selected at that point, that becomes an unselect operation. And um, if, if um, I found an object there that was an unselected, then basically I select it. That's all it is. And in the mouse move event, of course, uh, we need to so that is basically, I've clicked on the object, I haven't released the button, and I want to drag that over here. That's essentially what's done here. We translate the uh, screen coordinates into real-world longitude-latitude values and shift the object by doing that. Now, same thing. Same application, um, slightly extended, with the ability to have markers. So. In this particular case, 
uh, I have two modes here. The map mode is is the mode that um, you saw previously already. It allows me to pan and zoom, etc. And I have a marker mode here. I can just drop them somewhere on the screen. I have a very simple pix map here. You can do this, obviously, far more sophisticated and maybe even have the designer doing that. In my case here, it's just a blob. I put a couple of those on here, and if I select one, I basically see over here the longitude and latitude I have selected. That's the mapping mode. And when I go back in map mode, sorry, that's the marker mode. When I go into mapping mode, I again start panning around. That's the code that you see here. A bit more, a couple more pieces, but essentially the same. Now, we have set our marker on the map. Now we really want to make that, link that up to a real address on the street. And that's where geocoding comes in. Geosearch Manager, that's the second class that came out of that plugin, the second interface to be implemented. It is responsible for translating an address into a coordinate or vice versa. When it's, a, uh, when it's um, a translation from an address to a coordinate, it's called geocoding. If it's uh, translating a coordinate into an address, it's reverse geocoding. There's also the ability to say free text search. So you just enter some, some text and it will try to find that location somewhere on this planet. Obviously, you may get a list depending on how, how accurate your search criteria is. Yep. Um, can we get a ca um, microphone here? Microphone? By the way, just keep going. Bounding box limitation, so I can actually also limit that kind of search to a particular region on this planet. Uh, hi. Uh, so what sort of uh, address database do you use for geocoding and reverse geocoding? Again, that's talking to the NavTex server. OK. And this, the, the principle how you get the data, obviously, that's an asynchronous operation. So you get the standard reply request kind of infrastructure send your request. Oh, well, in this particular case, you just send it the search string and you get a reply object which you hook up into and it tells you when it's finished and then you can retrieve the data from it. And you get a list of geo places. That's basically coordinates, address, bounding box related. Um, that's the outcome of that. Here's a, a small example. I have a geo search manager and in this particular case, I'm I'm uh, hooking up, I'm listening for the search reply being finished. And um, I'm providing an address, and I want to know what coordinate that address is at. So the search manager gets is, is fired up. And once the search manager has something for you, um, I'm calling my finished slot. And again, very simplistic view here. I'm just grabbing the first one of the results. You can drill that further down as much as you like, as much as the server basically finds data for you. And then get rid of the reply object. Again, I've done, modified the same example, doing the same thing. So this time I'm showing the map. I'm putting a marker on it. And once I have something, Let's just drill further in. Just to get some decent stuff that I might actually be able to show. So, somewhere in the outback, I'm placing a marker and then oh even two and then I've basically in this particular case I'm doing a reverse geocoding lookup I have a coordinate and I'd like to have an address and that's what you see in the bottom there street districts city state country Okay, geo routing.
Again, it works on the same principle. I want to go from waypoint 1 to waypoint 2. In fact, you can even specify sub, um, intermediate waypoints. It's possible as well. But at this point, I'm just concentrating on the most, simple, uh, most simplistic case, which is I want to go from A to B. The manager has, a, in this particular case, a reply request mechanism, reason that is, um, in the case of routing, you there uh, slightly more, there's a bit more information that you possibly want to send to the um, server. So the request object basically gives you the ability to set all the things that you need. Um, and in fact, some of them are actually mentioned there. So I can say that um, I'd like to have a certain travel mode. Um, a travel mode could be by car, by foot, by public transport. There are enums for each, all of those. In fact, you can even actually cross-match them. A particular use case that comes to my mind would be, well, I have a bike. So I'd like to have a street combination with public transport. Then I will basically make some kind of suggestion. Hop on the bus there, get off, use your bike, go to the next point. Obviously, the, the, the usual optimization types that you see, that you see on, on, on the standard uh, navigation devices, well, I don't like to pay toll, so please find any way that this is the shortest but doesn't cost me any money, for instance, that kind of scenario. And of course, ratings along the lines of I prefer highways over countryside scenic kind of thing. Even areas to avoid are possible, so I want to go from A to B, but please, I don't want to go in that particular area here at all. Speed cameras or something. And what you get back from the server is essentially a list of waypoints. So it will give you, if they are um, sufficiently equally rated options, then it will give you all those options. Um, but each of these options is basically represented by a geo route, and it basically is a graph, a linear graph at this point, um, whereby you have uh, the dots in the graph are pretty much the instructions. So something like um, turn right now, that's just a text string. And then you have the route segment, which is basically the go along 500 meters on the A5 or something. Um, it's also possible that you don't have an instruction. Um, possible scenario for that would be my highway suddenly turns into a dirt road uh, from one into the other. There's not really any instruction that I have to give the user. Well, maybe s slow down or something. But um, from a from a from a, a navigation point of view, the system now needs to know now. Okay, this is a it, it, it can also give you estimations on, for instance, um, time updates and how long do I take to get there. And something like a highway to dirt road change would be something that would be considered as quite important, actually, to calculate how much time I might take. And essentially, as you go further down the road, the, 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 the tree, um, you get to your destination. And if you have now an intermediate waypoint, you basically can imagine that this list obviously becomes much, much longer, and then somewhere in between you also have a waypoint. But a waypoint, again, is just a coordinate. It's just that the system looked it up in such a way that you will come past that point. A um, couple of more things here which are in interesting. In the maneuver section, uh, the maneuver is the point where the, where the instruction is sitting to the user. Um, besides the instruction, it will also have things like um, when that instruction should be more suitably issued um, in advance to the actual thing coming up, the actual action, and or should it be a U-turn, it's a very simple enum, uh, U-turn or slightly left or hard, uh, hard left, something like that. <coughs> Here's an example. This time we have a geo-routing manager. And we're basically passing in two coordinates, waypoints. Um, the first one is considered to be the starting point. The second one is considered to be 
the destination. If, you, if that list were to have more, then there would basically be the intermediate ones. And in this particular case, I'm choosing that I'm traveling by car, and off you go, calculate the route. And again, I get a reply back from the system. In a real world scenario, you might then let the user choose if there are more uh, multiple options, which way he wants to go. In this particular case, I've basically chosen to um, pick the first one. And while this is loading, it, uh, essentially I've, uh, I can't see it, but nevertheless, um, it shows you that the example shows you already where you want to, um, it's so slow, how you then iterate through the, the tree. So I have, I get back a route and then I'm iterating through the route segments. And at the end of each, and each route segment, attached to each route segment is a maneuver. Till I'm reaching the end. And yes, you will have to, um, you will have to check, that's not visible here, but whether there is a maneuver because that's an optional thing. So in this particular case, I'm putting now two map markers on the map. I wanna go from here to there. And so I'm basically asking the server now, give me a route. And if I'm lucky, it gets me something back. Yep. Uh, maybe I should zoom out now a bit. Oh, that was a bit too far. Um, on the map now, you will see, well, here you can see it already, um, the route that you're going. Pretty much what you see from when you go on Google Maps and essentially what it's, it's, it's doing is, is it's going through each individual segment. Um, each individual segment has, a, has an endpoint and a coordinate and it basically just draws, draws a route on the map. That's all this is, connecting the dots. To give you, yeah, this application is not layouted very well, but just to give you an, an idea here, Local EN not supported yet. Awesome. Anyway, um, heading towards Monroe Street on New England Highway, go for 11 miles. Just to get an idea what's, what's, what the maneuver might look like. Keep left on Monroe Street, go for another half a mile. Uh, no, no such thing. So the question was whether there are any audio messages. No, there aren't any at this point. Sorry? There was a, uh, no, they're behind you. This is another question. Um, is there any actual routing support? So like map matching, like um, following a route? Or I'm not quite sure that I can follow. Um, if, if you're going with the phone, you have it on your phone and mm -hmm. you go around. And um, normally the position you got from the GPS isn't on the route. It's mm -hmm. 20 meters beside. So is there a map matching? So is it possible to, yes, correct the position to the street? Mm -hmm. Or again, is it um, another feature? Is there a routing? So if I go th through the route, is there a support like a navigation system as best? Okay, so you need to, f um, at this point, it's your responsibility to keep them updated. The API has, um, features which allow you to, um, I have this geo route here, but it has slightly changed, please update it. And it comes back with the same thing, but update it maybe potentially due to your GPS coordinates having changed, etc. So there's not a 100% match. You have to be a bit of fuzzy logic you have to apply at this point. Um, that's pretty much also the, the kind of logic that most GPS, um, well, navigation devi uh, device manufacturers have to apply to the whole lot. So you p potentially algorithm here could be, for instance, and that's again something that's supported by the um, by the, the library. You could do some things like, okay, how, am, how far am I currently 
with regards to the coordinate that I'm actually supposed to be. And then you can kind of try to make some, I guess, guesses as to whether that's accurate enough for you or you need to get an update on, on the system. Now, there was an interesting thing that um, came up. Um, you saw that a bit of ENU, uh, sorry, over that question. Hi. Can we do offline routing? So, as, as mentioned earlier, um, the online solution is available to everybody. However, Nokia devices will have only Nokia, well, unless somebody else writes a plugin for his or her particular device. Um, what you will find is that you will be able to access the offline storage on the, on the Nokia device. That's work in progress. Um, but outside of the Nokia box. Fully translatable, that's an interesting part. Um, since all that data comes from the NavTech server, you will find that if you go into the search manager and the geocoding manager, etc., you will find that you can set locales. And then that locale is used to tell the server, well, what country am I in? Or uh, sorry, not what country am I in? What's the language of the guy reading the text? So the certain NAFTEC server will take care of, it will basically return data to you that is uh, already suitable for whatever local you selected. That includes things like, well, miles versus kilometer or um, things like, um, well, I guess certain things like U-turn specific things if you're driving on the right side of the road or left side of the road, things like that. Well, actually that's not, that's not lo local specific. Presumably if you're a German guy driving in Australia on the other side of the road, you still probably want to have the U-turn the way it's in a local area. But yeah, you get my point. Um, Migo plugin, uh, we're working on that as well. That's something that Migo.com will get. Uh, it's based on OpenStreetView, um, OpenStreetMap. And, um, me, well, I guess, I guess Migo 1 or 2. Well, that's a decision Migo.com has to do. Obviously, it, um, I guess in the end, it's, it's a decision for the, um, for the particular device manufacturer who happens to use, I guess, Migo.com. But at the moment, Migo.com wants to go with something that's open source. So they will get some kind of, well, actually, in this particular case, it might be OpenStreetView or it might be something that's based on OpenStreetView. The OpenStreetMap server might just get overwhelmed with thing, things like that. Currently, it uses the OV uh, data set for all the maps and navigation. Um, it's an FTEC data service. NavTech, okay. I'm not quite familiar with how OV, OV uh, works, but um, it's conceivable that it's coming from an server at some stage as well. Yeah, okay, and just only one thing. Um, you said that it, it also provides uh, time estimation for routing. Yep. What sort of factors or... Uh, or uh, uh, parameters that this account for? I mean, for example, traffic. Does it take in consideration traffic? And um, that's a very good question, actually. I would have to look at, at it. I um, haven't really dived into that area yet. Uh, another question. Um, why do you use proprietary um, yes, interfaces to the root providers, to the map providers, and not um, OGC standards? Do you mean they're talking to the server? Yes, talking to the server, uh, naming of the classes and methods. Um, there are multiple reasons. Um, one of the um, interesting parts that you might find is this is a very close, this is work done in very close collaboration with NavTech. Um, and NavTech has a lot of clients. Um, JavaScript APIs, they offer C++, C++ APIs, C APIs, Qt based ones, non Qt based ones, etc., etc. Um, and one of the things that was done in the progress of a actually designing that API is to sort of making them from a naming perspective all the same. So 
it's really from a NAFTEC perspective a common naming structure. Um, well, actually, beyond that, there's not really much of a difference in reason. Yep. Are there any plans on uh, sort of adopting the OGC standards in the community or, or elsewhere? Do you know? Um, at this point, there are no no plans for that. Now, yes, as you as questions may have indicated already, there are still a lot of holes and gaps, things, features that might be really interesting to have, um, and the work on that, that API has not finished at all, but it's something that might serve a reasonable amount of use cases already. To give you a couple of examples here, vector-based mapping. Um, at the moment, it's all tile-based, and vector-based cases, so I guess when you look at a, nav a navigation device, you actually want to um, basically um, put that into the into the 3D space, rather than having a flat surface, you might want to actually uh, rotate your map, etc. That's the kind of thing that goes into a tilting here. That's the kind of thing that goes into vector-based uh, mapping, turn-by-turn um, -turn instruction, yeah, of course. Um, more elaborate kind of information given. Map, map object ordering, I was briefly mentioning that earlier. Maps go, you put basically uh, items on the map, but presumably you might want to say, rather than showing whatever item was drawn first, you might say, okay, this guy is a bit, bit further up, on the, bit, has a bit higher X coordinate in the 3D space, so I really want to hide this guy behind the other because it's slightly behind it. That kind of ordering of objects on the map, there's still areas for improvement, and the list is long, long, long. Just to um, give you an idea. Um, uh, can I ask a small question? Mm -hmm. You told that your example used now take data and you say OpenStreetMap data is also available. Can you list uh, uh, which different maps data providers we can use uh, with well, this API? Well, Cute Mobility has one plugin at this point, which is the one that talks to the NFTEC server. Um, at some stage, Amigo, OpenStreet, or whatever solution there to accommodate OpenStreetMap is chosen, is likely to be another plugin. Um, and there's likely to be also another plugin which is going to be no cap propriety, which is basically talking to the offline data storage. So that's, although it will not be available as, as um, in source or anything to, um, to third parties, you as a third party can, however, utilize that plugin because it will be on the, on the device. Okay, so by now take the data, is it identical to OVMAP's data? Um, I believe it's, pr it's pretty much the same, yeah. Thanks. So, and of course, I'm not sure whether the wireless LAN is any better. Um, yeah, it's still loading something. It's supposed to connect to, to the um, wireless LAN here, the Nokia one. Um, lots of people using it and it's getting slow. I'll just let it sit here, maybe it, I'll come. I can show something at the end of the, the talk. Sensor API, the second part. Again, here there are two use cases. I'm somebody who has a device, I want to ship a device to a customer, and I have this funky new sensor here, which I want to make available as a client API. So there is a make, make available to the client, so there is a plugin-based backend which allows you to customize or write, a plug uh, write, the, write, write the glue code to your particular sensor on the device that you may have. Um, obviously, in the case of Nokia devices, those are pretty much already part of the Keep Mobility uh, infrastructure. And the same will basically be the case for the Migo.com. Um, and so that's the backend implementation. Um, and then there's the front end part of it, which is the interaction with the client. Um, there are concrete sensor classes which allow you to interact with the sensor, but at the same time you might ha want to have a 
um, generic new sensor that isn't yet supported by the by the API. So there you can then also access, provided you have a plugin that provides that new data. Yes, you may not get a C++ API as convenience, but you can still retrieve that information. And things like uh, filtering, of course, is, is also supported. Like if you have a data source that's very high in, um, um, well, has a lot of data that's sending it through, you might want to filter on it or smoothen it or something like that. So you can install filters, very much like the event filter system in Qt. Install a filter, the reading comes through, you can decide, should I take the reading, should I change it somehow, and then pass it on, or maybe not, if not. Right now we have kind of four sensors, and well, four kind of derived sensors. The true sensors are accelerometer, ambient light, magnetometer and proximity, pretty self-explanatory. And the derived ones are kind of, you can basically, if, if you don't have a sensor hardware for that, you could potentially emulate them with a top-based one. So um, a rotation sensor is, is likely to be based, you can base it on a accelerometer. Um, compass is based on a magnetometer. And the orientation, again, accelerometer. Tap, again, is an accelerometer. It's basically double tap on the device. Here's briefly what I was talking about already. Essentially, there's a device plugin, and that's where new, hard, new, hard, new sensor adaption or hardware adaption can take place. And uh, the library basically goes through the system, what plugins are there, and um, it uses one, and then presumably based on name, um, it picks the right one. And the system, you as a, as a, as a third party application developer, um, go to the Q sensor for your particular uh, for your particular sensor, and you get a sensor reading back that has all the values in it. So here's a good example. I have a sensor, a solarometer sensor, and I connect to the reading change signal, and start. Give me data, and now I'm getting reading change notification in my reading change slot. Um, up here. I'm basically just reading the X value. It's a, it's a convenience class. Um, basically, all these concrete sensor classes are convenience classes around sensor, Q sensor. Um, and that's basically what's shown here. So in theory, if there wouldn't want to be an accelerometer sensor, you could still ask for, um, for a sensor called Q accelerometer. And what you get then is basically a sensor reading, Q sensor reading, not the specialized version. And it then uses either the meta object system to tell you what it is, the property name, or it's actually also a list. This is, this is basically the mechanism where you can hook up a new sensor that isn't actually present as a C shiny C++ convenience kind of sensor. And to show you that in action, I let's see if I got some map data. Nope, doesn't matter. Let's talk about the sensor one. So this application basically utilizes the sensor sensors on this hardware. Um, the N8 comes with a proximity sensor. Oops. And um, the object is not detected. And if, if you, I'm not sure if you, whether everybody has seen an N8 and how it particularly works, but Basically, the, the, the light, ambient light sensor and the uh, proximity sensor are these two things here on the bottom, or actually on the top. Um, so I'm basically just putting my hand on there, object detected, object not detected. Yeah, I accidentally pressed on the top there as well. That's the proximity sensor, ambient light sensor, the kind of same thing. Twilight, well, dark. It's not bright enough to get, oh, light, yeah. Again, it's a very simple kind of array of values. Um, orientation, yeah, I mean, everybody knows that kind of thing. It turns it around. Obviously, there are quite interesting effects that you can create here, like if, you, if your device by default turns the application around and then you, inside the application, turn it around again based on the orientation you might actually get off. So what I've done here, I'm actually, um, turning the, the default rotation of applications off just so that my 
application is the reference. You would have to be a bit more, or you would have to into, take into account, depending on your use case, whether you show something or not, but you may have to take into account that what's shown on the screen may not necessarily be the same as what's, um, what comes from the sensor, because you have a double rotation there. Um, magnetometer, yeah, that's basically uh, measuring the flux density in the magnetic field of the Earth. Um, this particular application here is, what it's meant to be is a kind of a electricity kind of stud finder behind the wall. So the idea is to calibrate it and then you basically just go along some surface where you might have some cables or something, something that might in influence the magnetic, yeah, some metal underneath. Yeah, there's some metal here underneath. So you get some changes in the field. The, I mean, uh, it's probably not the best use for a device like this, but and not sensitive enough, but you get the idea. And then, of course, things like compass and double tap. Um, with compass, it's also a thing that might be worth mentioning. They usually need to be uh, calibrated. Um, look on the internet. You will find quite a lot of ways of doing it. Sometimes also device specific, but um, an eight in the in the air does that usually. And then it should just turn around based on me turning the device. So obviously north is somewhere there. Yep. And last but not least, a bit of event filtering. So especially in the case of an accelerometer, that can give you a lot of readings in a very, very short time frame. There's a filtering mechanism which allows you to smooth that down. And um, you can actually, and that's one of the use cases, you might wonder why can I actually set, an, uh, set, set a sensor reading? Um, that's a, one of the use cases. I get the sensor reading from the sensor and I'm applying some smoothing algorithm, which I'm doing here actually. So I'm installing the filter, my smooth filter on the sensor and, and in the filter basically I'll just calculate the difference between the previous value and the current value if it's above a, uh, below a thresh threshold. I'm basically just smoothing the value out and setting it back on the reading. And then I'm returning true, which means, yep, please continue to process that. If it would be false, then um, it wouldn't even be forwarded to the client or whoever is looking for the connect signal. Again, there are many, many, many sensors under the sun. Um, just mentioned one here, Lux sensor, um, gyroscope, you name it, whatever you can find. And in theory, it should be pretty, pretty straightforward to just write a new plugin for those sensors and use them as well. Um, dynamic sensors, that's one of the things that we want to also want to change at the moment. Uh, do you, we detect up on application startup what sensors there are. There is at the moment no ability to say, that sensor has suddenly disappeared. Well, on a phone, it may not make a much sense because the sensor is always there, but if you have like a industry tribe game console kind of application, you might have a game controller which is disconnected from the box and suddenly the sensor disappears. Like most like um, PlayStation V kind of um, remote controller, they can actually be unplugged and then you see that that sensor basically disappears. That's pretty much for me. And I'm open for more questions, if there are any. Hi. Uh, I have a question regarding Navtech and uh, OviStore. So when the user uh, applies to OviStore, uh, does the application need to, to uh, provide some uh, screen regarding Navtech uh, terms and agreement? Um, I would have to uh, read that up. Uh, there is a terms and condition ship with the mobility um, in the in the plugin for it. There might be there might be something in there already, but on top of that, um, Ovi might actually apply something on top of that as well. So I'm not sure at this point. At this point. Uh, I have two questions. The first one is uh, regarding the maps. 
is it uh, I, I might have been missing something there but uh, is it uh, possible to write your own uh, uh, map source plugin to provide the uh, provide the map maps That's and, right. what, and then what kind of um, uh, are you giving in the coordinate for the center and the, the rectangle you want well there's to? basically a, a backend implementation API interfaces which you have to adhere to um, you can even do things things like the painting is basically done in the plugin. You you provide a large part of the of the painting, as well. It might be useful if, for instance, you're you're basing you 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 may want to use make some OpenGL kind of usage custom painting. Um, but essentially, there's an interface that you have to implement, and it uh, is the one that you can basically use to make your own mapping manager available to the system. Like for instance, on the tile, it's just pixel maps there. Put together on the grid, they come from the server as they are. Then, the second question is regarding the sensor uh, sensors. Is the is that the API available at the desktops as well? <coughs> so yes, uh, well, yes and no. The API compiles on pretty much everything. Um, the client, uh, the the the, the, the Q sensors library, you can compile, deploy, whatever you. Uh, there's no limitation on that. What you will find is that we don't have sensor plugins that actually talk to particular desktop OSs. Uh, so you may have to, um, depending on what hardware you use, etc., you may have to provide your own plugin. And then it will, will work. Uh, is there a limitation for uh, the server connection? Is Google there a Maps what? has a, a limitation. Limitation? Yes. I'm not quite sure what kind of limitation you're referring to. To connect to the server map. For example, Google Maps uh, have a limitation yep. of uh, uh, 100 calls. Yep. Um, so, 1, yes, there are um, some limitations, um, and uh, those are stated in the terms and conditions. For um, They are part of the source package, so just have a look at it. Um, it's it's uh, not as restrictive. Um, I guess one of the main benefits really is that you can embed it into your C++ client. You don't have to do any website kind of thing. Um, that's a limitation that other providers do impose. Do you have any plans for traffic information uh, API and also for binding it in the root calculation? Yes, there are plans for that, but um, at this point, nothing is really tentative. Uh, well, everything is pretty much tentative. As to in what form or shape that's offered um, remains to be seen. Over there. Oh, I sorry. Have a first. <laughs> um, uh, two questions I have. Um, one, what are the terms of use for this map data? Are you, are you allowed to use it, um, say, print it out somewhere or something like that? Or would, is it really that's true to use on the phone? Is it, are there any limitations on that? Is there a limitation on you using it in your th in your application on the phone? Is that what you're saying? Basically, and so we, say for example, we have a, we have a, a printing application that also allows you to show a map, and could we choose this map and allow the user to print it on our with our service? Or would this be something that is out of the scope of the terms of use? I, I figure I have, if you don't know now, I will have to check the terms of use. Well, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I'm not a lawyer either. <laughs> um, As it's always a company. There is a terms and condition, but um, they're fairly liberal. That's the only thing I probably want to say at this point. Um, read the terms and condition, <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> okay. um, the other question is, um, on Windows 7, the platform, they, they have added a lot of, um, I really mean the, the desktop platform, Windows 7, not mobile. And they've also had a lot of um, stuff regarding sensors and uh, maps, and so so I wonder if you are considering to to use those APIs to have at least uh, some support on on the Windows platform built in, basically. Um, there are no concrete plans at this point. Um, this is, I guess, the same um, similar kind of answer to why is there no um, Outlook Outlook backend for uh, contacts. In theory, it is possible. 
Um, and we are open for contribution in that area. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, there is so much work time. And my day only has 24 hours. In the back. Hi. I may have missed that, but is the Maps API available in QML? Yes. That's actually the thing I wanted to demonstrate. Um, uh, see whether it did load something. So, yes, there is a QML wrapper for it. Um, it's one of the, the wrappers that will not be entirely finished um, from, um, uh, for the 1.1 for the um, mobility release. We'll probably add that in the, the final touch to it in some of the patches. Um, it's just a matter of time. But yes, uh, the application that I wanted to show, which I can't, I don't get a connection in here or something, wireless is too closed, too blocked, is actually entirely uh, in QML written. Um, oh, here we go, actually. I get something. This is a QML application, just use, utilizing the location uh, wrapper for it. At this, the, I mentioned that there's a bit of a not quite finished thing yet. You can show something. You can also present, uh, draw something, but uh, some of the elements in the C++ API haven't been really exposed yet. We still need to fill that gap. And um, yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, naming is um, obviously something that you uh, can argue on, but it's basically most of those applications here in the top top row, the one that's with the green circle there. That's the one I started. It's QML Map Viewer. In fact, in the source tree for mobility, that's part of the mobility examples. You can just check it out. Uh, hi. Uh, do you provide any sort of uh, mechanism for distance calculation? Because these are all in geographic coordinates, and uh, yeah. 0 0.007 degrees doesn't tell me a lot. Yes, there are there are some classes for um, uh, distance co uh, calculations. That's actually part, was already part of the 1.0 release. Um, there, I, I do admit that there are also very, very specific use cases like um, distance between um, me being on the first floor of the same thing versus on the bottom floor. Um, so you might find corner cases not quite covered, uh, but in, in, in general terms, if you have reasonable dif distance between the two, yes, you can. Cool, thanks. Um. Extending this question, um, do you also support some projection cal calculation, or is this completely based on the map information that coming through the plugin? For okay, example, no, I have uh, Vegas v v 84, or I have a Google Mercator, or um, another. Um, yes, do you have only the degrees with an? Spatial that's with this map, and it's depending on the plugin. Or when I enter a coordinate uh, in Google Mercator, is there a projection framework that translates to VGS84 and to the plugin? Okay, so most of the, um, I guess you could they, you could come across two types of distance calculations in in the API. The one is I'm just having two coordinates somehow based in, 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 in 3D. And then you did the second one is the one that's coming from the server with regards to mapping. Because the map server gives you some distances based off, as based of instructions, etc. Um, those map kind of um, distances come from the server. We don't, there's nothing done on the device. It's all done on the server calculated and then based on the route returned to you. Um, with regards to just having two coordinates, which is now totally independent of maps. Um, there is there are some spatial algorithms in there. Um, 
I mean, I would have looked to have to look into the API. I vaguely remember that there were some options where you, how you can actually determine what kind of uh, ca distance calculation you also want to use. Um, but I'm not 100% sure at this point. I would have to look that up. You, you mentioned before that there's a possibility to wrap new sensors into the, uh, the the framework. What would it involve at the hardware level? I mean, do you have to provide your own driver and somehow uh, create a, the the uh, plumbing to connect it to Qt, or is it? What would that involve? So you have your own hardware device, and you just want to make that astronometer available via the Qt sensor. Yes. Yep. So if it's if it's uh, one of the sensors that we already uh, support as part of the convenience kind of sensors, the ones we know already about, then all it takes is basically for you to provide a plugin that implements a certain interface, which is described in the documentation, and that plugin you ship with your device, and then the the the, the library will basically look look at look that um, plugin up, and that's in fact at the moment how it discovers that there is a sensor on the device. Um, if it's a sensor that isn't um, that isn't known, like for instance a LUX sensor is not currently available. Um, then, again, you would have to provide a plugin, and then basically the the commented out sections here is what applies to you. So that's the generic sensor access kind of thing. You would name your sensor somehow, and then you would make a convention in your plugin as to how the properties are called uh, and or what their order is, and then you can access them as well through the client API. Okay, but w how how will Qt know to? I mean this. This has to be some kind of a, a hardware driver that will be running at the back end. Yeah, I mean, to the assumption. To provide the, the data. So Correct. The assumption here is that you have some. Dr I mean, we're not in the business of driving, um, writing device drivers either. It's in, in, in most cases, we are probably going to some kind of platform API, even um, some platform framework for a sensor. So you have two options here. You could say, okay, I'm integrating it with some well known s sensor framework. A possibility here might be Sensor D, which is something that's used on Nego. Um, another possibility might be to for you to write a platform, uh, a plugin that talks directly to the hardware. In fact, we have actually done that with the N900. It talks straight to the device. And, and which, with all the sensors or just? Sorry? For with, with which uh, part of the sensors in the N900? Um, well, uh, I mean, which of them, which is? Well, again, and I would have to, I mean, I'm not quite sure what the set of sensors is that the N900 supports, but I know for sure that, for instance, um, supports the accelerometer as a sensor. So we have written code that basically, I believe it's some device or some uh, proc value that you look up and you so basically you get notifications. You, you have a cute, uh, a cute class that actually reads for may maybe slash dev slash something and interprets the information. Correct. Great. Of course... I would always encourage you to actually integrate against a well-known interface because every API might just, every device might have just a different way of talking to it and you make a lot of, lot of work. Yeah, that's the last question. Um, are there naming restrictions when I introduce a new sensor? Um, Yes or no? No, in, in no in so far that if you have a new sensor, go for your life. Um, the only, pr why am, am I saying no? Well, first of all, I don't know what sensor you're going to name it. Uh, if you do something that's um, pretty, uh, pretty self-explanatory, let's say in the case I mentioned Lux sensor, it's likely that we're probably calling a Q Lux sensor. So if you don't have a convenience class for that, you might get some class clashes because obviously I don't know about your sensor. And um, but otherwise, no, not really. Obviously, you you making if you have your own sensor, you're making some kind of contract between your hardware specific part and the client sitting on top because they kind of need to know the string for that name for that, the name for that sensor. Okay. okay, thank you very much.